the other, last Saturday I was looking at YouTube and I came across um, this video of a caterpillar and it was in slow motion turning into a butterfly. Pretty amazing. And I didn't know that. I knew the caterpillar would get on a tree, turn into a cocoon, cocoon, and then all of a sudden a couple of days later, boom, it's a, it's a butterfly. But I was watching it in slow motion. These things, the, the caterpillar climbs up on a, on a branch and then he hooks himself there. And then all of a sudden he starts shaking, like the really vibrating. And is he vibrating so hard, his skin starts to crack and it splits open from the bottom. And then all of a sudden he's vibrating and the skin starts, you know, and then it starts oozing this stuff. And that's the stuff that gets hard and turns into a cocoon. cocoon. Anyways, it's a cocoon. I don't know. Anyways, so it gets hard and then. He's in there, that caterpillar, and it's a cocoon. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, in two days, all of a sudden it starts vibrating again. That cocoon starts breaking. It rips open, and this beautiful butterfly comes out. It's pretty amazing. Totally different creature that went in. Totally different. Came in a worm or a caterpillar, and it comes out a beautiful butterfly. That is a metamorphosis. In the Greek, the word is for change is meta. That's, that's the Greek word, change. And that's an amazing change that happens. No one can deny it. No one can say it didn't happen. That was a caterpillar, and now it's flying. Something changed. Again, the Greek, the Greek word for change is meta. Metamorphosis, the change. Metanoia is the Greek word for repent. Meta, change, noia, your mind. That's what it is to repent, to change your mind. So when you go through the Bible and you hear, you see repent, it's metanoia, change your mind. How, sh what should we do to be saved? Change your mind. Go another direction. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized. And that, it's meta, Change metanoia. It's pretty interesting. Here's how Webster describes change. He, sa he says, to make the form, nature, content, or future course different from what it is now. That is change, and that's what happens to somebody that when they come to Christ, there is a change that happens. It's a metamorphosis, if you will. Paul describes a person that comes to Christ this way. It's in 2 Corinthians 5.17. I'll read it to you. He says, if anyone is in Christ, listen to this, they are a new creation. They're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, we read that or we hear that and we just go, that's cool. But what it says is something totally different than what... Most Christians accept. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That word new is kainos in the Greek. Here's what it means. It means recently made. It means fresh. It means unused. Recently made, fresh, unused. If anyone is in Christ, they are recently made. They are fresh. They are unused. Behold, all things have are passed away. Old things have gone away. Behold, all things are recently made. All things are fresh. All things are unused. It's not overhauled. It's not refurbished. It's not restored. It's a totally different... It is unused, never been used before. That's huge if we grasp it. Here's why. A lot of Christians and so-called Christian uh, counselors will say, you are the product of your upbringing. 
You are the product of your mom, your dad, the things that happened to you in the past, the things that was all the scars, and that has created your personality now. And some of the things you struggle with is because of your dad, or some of the things that you struggle with is because of your mom, or because of your environment. But that's not what the scriptures say. The scripture says when you come to Christ, you're unused, you're fresh, you cannot reach back and use those old hurts and use those old scars and use those old excuses to make excuses on how you are now. God says, no. When you come to Christ, you are fresh. You are unused. You are not restored. You're not refurbished. You're like that caterpillar that came out of butterfly. All things have become new. Now, all means all, that's all, all means. It means all, all things have become new. Now you, you, the past is gone. Now, Paul says, put on the mind of Christ. No excuses, no anything, you are a new creation. And there's a change, the change of salvation. It's interesting how... Jesus describes somebody who was born again to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you, you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So is everyone that is born again. In other words, when the wind blows, you see the trees moving, you see things happening, leaves blowing. There's something happening. There's this kind of power that's going on you don't uh, you don't know where it's coming from or going so is everyone who is born of the spirit so when you come to christ there's something about you there's some power there it's not the same person that just smiles a lot more there's this power there's this change they're not the same they don't reach back everything is new pretty amazing in other words there is signs of salvation. And that's what we're going to read today. John chapter 14, starting in verse 9. I'm going to read all the way to 31, and then we'll go back and we'll break it down. How's that? So verse 19, and Jesus is speaking. He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live, you will also live. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judas, who is not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So there's a difference. There's some people he's going to manifest, some people he's not. Not to the world. And Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine but the father who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while being present with you. But the helper, the Paracletus, that's the word, the Holy Spirit whom the father will send in my name he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because I give you this peace. Verse 28, you have heard me say to you, I'm going away and coming back to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than me. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk too much with you. For the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. So let's get up and get out of here. We'll pause right there. And what's going on? Well, a little backdrop, of course, we're still in the Last Supper. We're still in the upper room, and Jesus has told them a few things. He's going to say, hey, 
We saw, saw that he says, somebody's going to betray me. Uh, they're all like, who's going to be? Is it going to be me? Is it going to be me? And then, of course, it's the guy I dipped the bread with. And it was, of course, Judas. And then he got possessed by Satan. And Jesus is, was troubled in spirit because Satan was in the room. And so he got possessed. And then Judas went and did uh, what he's going to do. And so that's the first thing. And then he says, I'm going to leave and then I'm going to come back. And they're kind of bummed out. And that's when Peter, and then it goes on to say in other places, you know, the sheep gets struck and the she, the, she, the shepherd gets struck and the sheep scatter. And Peter says, I'll never leave you like these guys, these bums, you know. And we're going to see he does in, this, in a little bit. But Jesus is telling them these things. Now he's telling them in this section we read the things that are going to take place in them when the helper comes. Those are the signs of salvation. And today I have five, if you're taking note. Number one sign is God's presence will be with you and in you. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And here, listen to this. And we will come to him and make our home with him. If you're taking notes, circle that word home. It's the Greek word mane. It means to abode. It means to dwell. It means inhabitation, those three words. That is mane, or mone, really, in the Greek. So Jesus said, and that's the answer to verse 22. He says, how are you going to manifest yourself to us in verse 22? And he says, this is how I'm going to manifest. The Father and I are going to come and mone with you. We're going to abode in you. We're going to, we're going to make our dwelling place in you. We're going to inhabit you. That's what he says. That's, that's how he's going to manifest ourselves. That's the answer to verse 22. When Judas, not Iscariot, said, how are you going to do it? He says, we're going to, we're going to live in you. Pretty amazing. Here's why I want to make that a point. You hear it all the time and it makes me so frustrated with these people that say, hey, these altar calls and this and that. And no one's ever said, ask Jesus into your heart. You want to bet? These guys can't read the scriptures. These guys don't know the word of God because they're all over the place. You got it in Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in me. We got it in Ephesians 3.17, Christ makes his home in your heart. And so when we say, let's ask Jesus to abode, make his home, to live in your heart, that is very, very scriptural. And here Jesus himself is saying, if you love me, you're going to keep your commandments. And if you do, we're going to abode in your heart. We're going to come in your heart. So when we in our English vernacular say, ask Jesus to come in your heart, very biblical. But we have these clowns that say, don't say that. Nowhere it says to invite Jesus in your heart. It's all over the scriptures. But what they're saying, and Satan's very, very tricky, no altar calls. No do this. No do that. Just entertain. And we're all the way off of that. But it's always been a proclamation of Jesus Christ and what he's done. And then an invitation to make Jesus abode, abide in their, in their hearts. It's always been that way. Satan's very, very tricky. Oh, I hate that. And the difference I pointed out because you hear even a lot of Christians today, you know, we're all God's children. No, we are not. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. God's children, he manifests himself to and he lives. That you have to be adopted into the family of faith. So when people say, you know, we're all God's children, I always say, no, we're not. And they're like, why? And then I give you an ex, an ex, uh, she, I got, I lost my train of thought. I, um, it gives me an excuse to share the gospel because I say, no, we're not all God's children. And they go, yes, we are. And I say, no, we're not. You have to be adopted. What do you mean? Now you got the gospel. You have the gospel of Jesus Christ. So number one sign of salvation is God's presence in us. He makes his home 
in us. Pretty amazing when I hear people say, you know, I always say, hey, when the Holy Spirit talks to you, what is he? Uh, I, I don't know. Well, wait a minute. What do you mean you don't know? It's a personal real. He's real. He's a, it's not a thought. It's not, it's not a full, it's a person. It's a person who, when, God, when he speaks to you, how does he do it? And, and I've had myriads of Christians say, hey, God doesn't speak to me. And then I'm like, whoa, there's, there's an issue. That goes along with what I've been fighting in the South for two years. He speaks through us through this. Well, yeah, he does. But he's not silent in our lives. He, well, we, the Holy Spirit, there's no new revelation. Oh, yes, there is. When God said, hey, when I, we prayed and said, should we move to Arizona? Well, it's not in here. So the revelation came from the Holy Spirit. Do it. That's a prophecy. That's the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to go there. But the traditional, God doesn't speak to us that way anymore. He only speaks to us through His Word. Oh, really? I have two jobs, Lord. You, there's up, which one do you want me to take? The Holy Spirit, no, I want you to direct my path. Well, oh, don't do that. That's, uh, just go find it. Well, you know what? Uh, secretary at this dental office or a secretary at this doctor's office isn't in here. The helper, the Holy Spirit, will lead you. And also, so there's a personal relationship. He abides in us. So number one, sign of salvation, God abides with us. Number two, there's a deep desire to do God's word and God's will. A deep desire to do God's word and God's will. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come and make our home with him. So there's a deep desire to do God's word. He says, if you love me, we're going to see. It's not going to be, there's no guessing here. We're going to see that you're going to keep my will and my word. Everybody can see it. Everybody can say, what happened to what happened to Carlos? He used to be out there partying and stealing beer and doing all these stuff. Now he won't go partying. Now he doesn't drink beer. Now he doesn't do this. Now he doesn't hang out. What happened? So there's a deep desire to do God's will. And what, it, it's just, a, a, it's, it's the progression of salvation. And the, you can't see it better than in the Beatitudes. You know, blessed is he, blessed is he, you know that? Well, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. What does poor in spirit mean? It means that I'm bankrupt spiritually. I, I need help. Blessed are, and those that say, I'm bankrupt spiritually, I need help, I need you to save me, whose theirs is the kingdom of God. Because they come to Christ. They know they, they need a savior. Then blessed are the poor in spirit. What happens next? Blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit touches us, we know we're spiritually bankrupt. We say we need a Savior, and then we mourn over who we are. We're like, man, I'm a, such a scumbag. And you mourn, and you ask God to save me and forgive me and have mercy on me, all the stupid things I've done. So blessed are the poor in spirit. You're bankrupt spiritually. Because if you realize that and ask Jesus, you're going to have the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn because if you really are truly repentant and you really, the Holy Spirit really showed you who you are, you're going to mourn over the stupidity of who you are. And then all of a sudden, man, you're going to be comforted. The Holy Spirit will come in. That's okay. You're a new creation. All those things are old and all those things have passed away. And blessed are the meek. Because all of a sudden now you're born again. You're no longer, you know, you're meek. Meekness isn't weakness. Meekness is power under control. It's it's used to describe a horse so powerful but can be controlled by a little bit, right? It's meek. 
We're meek now as Christians. We're supposed to be. And that's where the Holy Spirit has to come in and temper us. Because now we have this power under control where before we weren't under control. It's the progression of salvation. And then the next is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's what happens. You come and you get saved. You realize who you are. Now you, the Holy Spirit is tempering you. And now you want to do God's will in God's word. You want to obey his word. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then after that, what happens? Blessed are the merciful. After that, you are merciful to people because God has been merciful to you. That's the progression of salvation. And there's a change in a person. You have to see it. There's a lot of people that say they believe in God, but there's no change. There's the same, same, same. You can't tell B.C., A.D. You can't tell. But for the true believer, there is a change. The wind blows. There's a power. You don't know what, what happened to him. What happened to her? Something happened. So number one, there's a presence with us. Number two, there's a desire to do God's will. And number three, the Holy Spirit teaches us and reminds us. Look at verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Remember? All means all. That's all all means. Who's going to teach us all things? The Holy Spirit. That's who's going to teach us all things. Whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything I said to you. Pretty amazing. He's going to bring... You cannot really understand these letters on a paper without the Holy Spirit. You can't. It's impossible. Without the Holy Spirit, it's just literature, like you're reading Plato or Homer or Aristotle. There's nothing different. But with the Holy Spirit, it is different. I ask you to turn first, keep your finger here, I ask you to turn first Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says, Paul says something brilliant to those in Corinth. Verse 10, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church who's is uh, talking about spiritual things because they were abusing the gift that God gave them, the helper, uh, the Holy Spirit. And he says, verse starting in verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Them, he's talking about spiritual things. And all, all the spiritual things that, the Corinthians church was abusing. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Got it? We know ourselves. Our spirit knows who we are. And the Holy Spirit knows who God is and all things about God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. In other words, the, the spirit of God that knows everything about God has been given to us. It's inside of us now. And so that spirit that's been given to us by God knows everything about God. And he's the one that's going to lead us into all truth. Now, now, when this, the canon of scriptures were put together, this helper didn't fly away. He didn't leave us. He didn't stop doing what he was always been doing. And a lot of people say, how, you ask people, how did this Bible get put together? Uh, I don't know. Okay, when did the canon of scriptures got put together? Put together? I don't know. Well, what council? 
Nicaea. No, it wasn't Nicaea. Nicaea was about, what else? Trent? Yeah, the Council of Trent. Capital Carthage. Who put this canon of scripture together? Well, it was a bunch of priests. And they're the ones that decided what comes in here and what comes out. In here. Well, what happened between uh, Trent and Carthage? How come there was a bunch of books taken out? Well, they decided, and you, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this the word of God? Yes. The, one, the ones in here. I'm going to say something that most people blow their heads. Is there other books that are the Word of God? Yes. It talks about the book of Jasher. Jasher. Why isn't it in here? It used to be in. Why did they take it out? They quote the book of Jasher in here. Why did they take it out of here? Jesus quotes the book of Enoch ten times. Why did they take it out of here? Jude quotes Enoch. Why did they take it out of here? Why doesn't Christians know how this thing that is our plumb line, that is the one, our way to know things, how come they don't know how this thing was put together? How, did, how come they don't know when it was put together? How? Study to show thyself approved. Does that mean study this? Yeah. But to study everything from the foundation, from our founding fathers, from the apostles. And then you learn, then, then things start. Whoa, I didn't know that. So it's been freely, freely given to us by God. Verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. But the natural man, that's somebody that doesn't have been manifested. That's somebody that doesn't have the Holy Spirit. But the natural man receives the things of the Spirit of God, for that he doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he even know them because they have to be spiritually discerned. A natural man without being born again cannot actually understand this because they're foolishness to him. Have you ever seen, yeah, before you were saved, have you ever read the Bible before you were saved? Like, it's like Chinese to me. And then after you're saved, you start reading it and you're like, whoa. And then after, whoa. And then you read John, whoa, I didn't know that was in there. You know why? Because now you're not a natural man, you're a supernatural man, really, woman, because you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that knows everything about God is now living in you, and when you're reading this, he's telling you things. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And he teaches us all things. Not only teaches us, reminds us, it says Jesus. Have you ever been witnessing to somebody and they ask, I've, I, I, witnessing to somebody and you're sharing the gospel and they ask you questions and all of a sudden the scripture pops up, boom, and you're telling them and then all of a sudden, boom, another scripture pops up and you're not even thinking about that scripture, but it, that scripture pops up in your mind, you tell them and it relates to everything you're talking about and then all of a sudden you're witnessing and then boom, another scripture and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is reminding you all the things that you have read. And that what Jesus is saying. That's why you got to read what Jesus says. And then, you, and then it's like, and they're like, "Wow, you really know your Bible." Well, about five minutes ago, I didn't know anything I was going to talk about, but the Holy Spirit reminded me of it. And not only that, you're witnessing, and then the Holy Spirit, what is? You're you're at the grocery store, and you see somebody, and the Holy Spirit says, "Go talk to them." Have you have that ever happened? To you? Go talk to them. And you're like. Mm. <laughs> right? And you're like, go talk to them. And go go tell them what I've done for them. And then you go. And then all of a sudden, wow, that was amazing. Who teaches us the Holy Spirit? Who reminds us of Scripture and what to do? The Holy Spirit. Who pushes us 
to share the gospel. The Holy Spirit. I, I wrote here seeds of salvation for me. How I brought, the, you guys know some of them. But when I was fifth, five years old, my mom had, we had five, I have five, four brothers and four sisters. There's five of us all one year apart. So my mom had a one year old, two year old, three year old, four year old, five year old. All together. And my dad's always working. She never worked. And we were cleaning off her. And every six months, she'd have a nervous breakdown <laughs> because of that. And my dad's old school, right? She, he comes home, and the, the, the dinner has to be ready. And these kids are around, and she's like, ah, ah. So my mom figured out. She didn't speak too much English back then. But she figured out there was this big old bus that came by. And, and then they'll take your kids for four hours. And so, so this bus comes by, a guy named Larry, he's a bus driver, they take us to the Baptist church. My mom would be <laughs> waiting for us, line up, get in there, and then four hours without the kids. And this Larry guy would be singing songs to us, telling us about Jesus, and taking us to this Baptist church. I don't know where. But, but I know when we get there, there's candy. There's candy when we got to the Baptist church. And so we, we go in there and, they make a saying, they make, and then if you memorize the scripture and you memorize it next week, they're going to give me more candy. And so I'm, you know, my, back then I had a, Mex, a thick Mexican accent because, so I'd be quoting my scriptures and getting my candy. I had no idea what they meant, but I memorized it so I can get my candy. But this Larry guy just loved sharing the gospel to kids. That was a seed in my heart. And then next was the diesel truck mechanic, I've told you guys, that fixed my dad's truck and shared the gospel with me. What made them do that? The Holy Spirit. Then after that, it was the hippie at Knott's Berry Farm. I've told you that story. Jump in the fence at Knott's Berry Farm. Hippie grabs my ankle, brings me down. I'm ready to fight him. And he's like, hey, little brother, you... You know about Jesus? And his eyes are <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah. And he tells me about Jesus. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Then jump the fence, go with my friends. And then the last one was a gal named Susan that invited me to concert when I was a senior in high school. And I thought it was a concert. So I go, yeah, but it was a Christian concert. She tricked me. And then the guy shared the gospel and all those seeds came to fruition that night. And I accepted the Lord. But what made them do that? It was the manifestation of God, what Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, God dwelling in us that teaches us, that reminds us, that pushes us, that warns us. Looking back in my life, every time I've sinned, every time, the Holy Spirit was there going, don't do that. There was never a time in my life that the Holy Spirit didn't say don't do that. And, I, and then the one, when I did, I just ignored it and went on and train wreck. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? But he was always there. He was always there warning us. He was always there teaching us. Always there reminding us. So signs of salvation. God's presence is with you. Number two, there's a deep desire to do God's will. Number three, the Holy Spirit teaches and reminds us. Number four, we experience a peace that's out of this world. Look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And so because of that, let not your heart be troubled. Or don't be afraid. So there's this, another sign of salvation is this peace that is out of this world. Circle that word peace in verse 27. It's the Greek word arene. Now, these three words describe that Greek word. Untroubled, undisturbed, absence of strife. That's what arene means. What does he say? Arene, I leave with you. 
I'm going to leave with you, I'm going to leave you untroubled, I'm going to leave you undisturbed, and I'm going to leave you with no strife. And it's a supernatural peace that I give you. Have, have you ever read the scriptures? Have you ever seen Jesus freaking out? No. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, but he wasn't freaking out. And that's, he says, I give you that same thing. When Peter comes up, oh, they want our taxes. <laughs> Remember that story? They want our taxes. Ah! And Jesus is like, just go fishing. And he did, and he found the money and paid the tax. You know, never seen Jesus freaking out about anything. He says, that's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you something that the world can't have. And that's a peace that surpasses understanding. It's a peace. And David wrote in Psalm 23, he restores my soul. That word restore is the shub. It's the um, Hebrew word shub. And they use that word to describe a river that has been raging, overflowing, going back to its proper levels. That shub. He says, he does that. He brings my soul back to its proper levels. I'm undisturbed. There is no strife. There's not, well, Carlos, that's good for the normal person, but we have this and I have this and the doctor said this. No, it doesn't say anything there. Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to give you a peace unless you have hormonal problems. Then I can't give you that peace. I'm going to give you that peace unless you have, you know, bipolar disorder. I, 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 then I can't help you. <laughs> he never said that. He says, I'm going to give you something that surpasses all that. I'm going to give you this piece, shub. It's, it, I'm going to give it to you. I, I googled peace, um, 791 results on peace. On world peace, 112 million. On personal peace, 410 million. On spiritual peace, 84 million. So the world is searching for peace. But they reject the Prince of Peace, the one that can give them the peace that they're searching for. They reject it. So I want to bring this close to home. When things go wrong in our lives, what do our family and our friends and our co-workers see in us? Do they see us freaking out? Do, do they see us disturbed? Do they see us with striving? Do they see us Troubled? Or do they see us untroubled? Undisturbed? Without strife? And they know what you're going through. That's pretty amazing when they see all that and you're like, Jesus, hmm. you know, no big deal. And they go, what is it? How? How are you not freaking out? Because, listen, there's this peace that Everybody's searching for it, but nobody finds it. It's the only peace that comes from Jesus. Well, I want that peace. Okay, awesome. You can have that peace. You know there's two times, two kinds of godly peace. There's peace with God. Because before you come to Christ, you're at war with God. You're not at peace with God. You're at war with God. You know that scripture says, if God is for me, who can be against me? You know that? Everybody quotes. The opposite is true. If God is against me, who can be for me? And when you're not with Christ, God is against you. And who can be for you? Nobody. So the first godly peace is peace with God. The second godly peace is peace with from God. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses understanding will guard what? Their heart and mind. 
promises. I get in trouble all the time because there's a lot of Christians that I love and love, 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 but they are sedated with all these antidepressants. Okay, I love you. Okay. But God promises something that's beyond all that. If you trust him. Well, Carlos, that's very dangerous. Because, you know, I'm just telling you what Jesus says. I'm telling you what the word of God says. I'm just telling you. I have a friend that is prone to depression. I talked to him and he calls me and I said, this is what you got to do. You got you to give your heart to Jesus. And he's, well, I'm going to a counselor and I tell him what I need. To, and I said, what did the counselor say? And I said, he, she, she said this, this, and this. And I said, exactly what I told you the day before, right? Without charging you 150 bucks. <laughs> you know, and, and there's, it's unbecoming. I'm going to say this out of love. There's, there's a line, there's an old, not the new one, there's an old Anne of Green Gables. Have you ever seen the old, old one? And, um, She's very dramatic, the girl, and and she tells her guardians, I'm disturbed, I'm troubled. Uh, uh, and she says a line that never, to be disturbed is to turn your back on God. And I went, whoa. I, I, I saw that about 30 years ago. And she told her, to be disturbed is to turn your back on God. Like you see Job, undisturbed. He said, I, I, I wish I was never born. But it said in all of that Job, he never sinned. And God says, I have this thing for you. We have all this treasure, Ephesians 1 and 2, in Christ. It's like having a million dollars in your checking account, but you throw away the ATM card because you go, eh. I'd rather go get a loan. I'd rather go do this. I'd rather go do that. And he's like, no, you have it all right here. And you go, nah, I'm going to go get a loan. I'm going to get the credit card. And I hammer it in. No, you don't need all that. You got... And God says, I have all this. Trust me. Fight through it. Hold on to me like the girl that grabbed onto her his hem of his garment. And just don't let go. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding who guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's a promise. But listen, you can't have the peace from God until you have peace with God. That's the first thing. So, going over number one, signs of salvation, God's presence is with you. Number two, a deep desire to do God's will. Number three, the Holy Spirit's with us, teaching us and reminding us. For, number four, there's a peace, supernatural, out of this world peace that God has for us. And number five, coming to a close, we distance ourselves from worldly things. We distance ourselves from worldly things. You know, I, I cannot for the life of me, hear Christians Google and scream when they hear about Beyonce. It's like, what are, or, or Taylor Swift, or, it's like, what are you doing? These people are evil. Why are you celebrating them? Number, the, one of the signs of salvation is you separate yourself from worldly things. When I was a brand new Christian, I had a ton of friends. I was very popular. I had a lot of hair in high school. And I, you know, wavy. And I was an athlete. I was very popular. And, and I always went to parties and always had this stuff. But when I got saved, I, I, my friends, I lost a bunch of my friends. Because I wouldn't do as much. I wouldn't do. It didn't happen overnight, but it almost did. You know? I was I had the filthiest mouth. I cussed so much. In third grade, Miss Lamarco washed my mouth out with soap because I was f bombing at, at the kickball game because we were losing. And she took me out in front of the class. I was like a cheese grater. I cussed all the way through until I got saved. And then, like two three months into it, I'm like, man, I haven't cussed for like two weeks, three weeks. It's like weird. And then try. 
then just, but I, this girl, Susan, gave me an open Bible. It was red. And I started reading that. I read, in the first month, I read the whole Bible cover to cover. My dad was so mad at me. Because every time he saw me, I'm reading. And he was so mad, you know. And then he'd get mad at me and made me go do something outside. Then he'd come back and I'm reading the book. You know, in the first year, I think I read through the Bible t- three times. Because I was like hungry. And then, but I didn't think about not cussing. It just happened. It's like, I don't cuss anymore. I mean, it was every other word, F-bomb and this and that. Just like it was crazy. But, it's, but you separate yourself. I'll close with this. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, whose leaves will not wither. and Whatever he does will prosper. But I love that psalm because there's a progression there. First you walk, then you stand, and then you sit. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Now, when we hear that, we think sinners and partiers and revelers and drunkards. It's ungodly, just simple, somebody that doesn't have God. Could be a really outstanding citizen in the community. Could be a really, really good moral person, but they do not have God. Blessed is the man who does not walk in their counsel. But if you start walking in the counsel of the ungodly, then you'll find yourself standing in the path of sinners. Now, sinners are what we thought, you know, people that go out, get drunk all the time and shoot up heroin and all that. When you walk in the counsel of the ungodly, you start standing in the path of sinners. And if you don't stop that, you end up sitting in the seat of the scoffer. There's a progression. So when we come to Christ, we don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. We don't stand in the path of sinners. And we don't sit in the seat of sinners. We separate ourselves from that kind of stuff. Does that mean as a Christian we don't do some stupid stuff? Yeah, we do. But it's not a lifestyle. And then the Holy Spirit, boom, spanks you a little bit. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. You know. But there's signs of salvation. Amen. Father, thank you for your word and thank you that you do your work in us and you are doing your work in us and you will continue to do your work in us. And we, Lord, surrender to that. In Jesus' name, amen.